In this video, I'm going to show you how I made this low poly boat animation. In the first section, I'll talk about how I made the model. And then the second, I'll talk about all the animation aspects. I've split the video into chapters so you can jump to the section that you are interested in. This video and model for that matter is made possible by the sponsors of this channel, Nvidia and PC Specialist. They were kind enough to give me this lovely machine here, which makes a huge difference to my workflow and what I'm able to achieve in Blender and every other creative program I use. You can see here how much difference the RTX 3090 card is making and how it's practically rendering my model almost in real time with their RT cores and AI tensor cores combined with using optics in Blender. It means I can play with the textures and lights and get instant feedback and in the end produce better quality and faster renders. PC Specialist are an NVIDIA Studio partner and leading system builders selling a range of customizable PCs that perform amazingly with Blender. They specialize in custom PCs and laptops for creators and gamers. So configure your next NVIDIA RTX system using PC Specialist's online configurator. And once again, for those that are interested, here are my machine specifications on the screen now, the RTX card being the most essential thing in my opinion. So thanks to NVIDIA and PC Specialist for making this all possible. So I started off with a sketch and that went through lots of iterations, ending up with what you can see in the top right here. I always like to do some sort of sketch and I have lots of reference images of boats and things like that on my other screen. If you want to learn how to do simple sketches, then do check out my drawing course. It certainly helps to have a general idea of where you're going before you start in Blender. It can really speed things up. Having said that, you can see I'm kind of sketching out ideas for the waves at the moment. And you can see here that I'm ending up with a spherical shape rather than a square base like I had in my picture. Once I've got that general shape, then I start on the boat and I keep everything really simple. So trying my best not to add too many loop cuts. The more loop cuts you add, the more polygons you have to move around. So I keep it all very basic. You can see that I use the knife tool quite often just to refine the shape and obviously the loop cut tool and extrusion tool. I always think that low poly modeling is one of the best ways to learn Blender as you have to simplify forms into their basic shapes, which is kind of the fundamentals of modeling any shape, no matter how realistic it is. When I make the top sort of cabin or control room bit, you can see that I keep that as a separate shape. So once again, I'm trying to keep things really basic, really simple. I'm not trying to make this all one mesh. Some people kind of obsess about that, especially if you're trying to use it in games, but even in games you're allowed to have overlapping geometry, that's absolutely fine. So this model would work absolutely fine in a game. I do kind of like to sketch with the sculpting tools, so sort of pull the mesh around and find a funky, fun shape. I experimented with the windows a fair bit, trying to make them rounded, but I thought that looked a little bit naff in the end, so I put it back to nice and square. That is the one section I'm not that pleased with is the windows. I think they're okay, but they're not brilliant. Then I put a pipe in with lots of kinks in it, and that's sort of like a steamboat thing. I'm sure lots of nautical people out there might say this boat is absolutely ridiculous, and that is all part of the fun. At this point, I changed the viewport display so I could see the sort of hard edges much easier. I think that just helps with the whole sort of modeling process, and I positioned it on my waves. And for the waves, I decided to use a sphere and kind of chop it off so it was a little bit more perfectly rounded. I do actually change that later on and I'll talk about that in the animation section. But I was kind of happier with this spherical shape. I thought that was a bit more fun. I do tend to jump around when I'm modeling as well. So I'll go from the boat to the waves and back again. I find that helps a lot with the creative process. It gives you a break between objects. So you can see I'm sculpting out the waves from this new spherical design. I'm using Dyn Topo and I've got it on quite a low resolution, so it's still very blocky and it's got that low poly feel. And I actually decimate it later on to make it look even more low poly. I move the boat into a position I like, but then I make a copy of it to work on and to continue the modeling process. It's much easier to model when it's in line with the axes and I can obviously just reposition it later. I used a simple torus for the tires that go around and apparently they're called fenders. Generally, I used a instance to duplicate them, so I only had to change one and it would update on all of them. For the sort of low poly person or crew member, I did this really quickly and quite roughly as well. I wasn't too worried about the topology and originally I wasn't going to animate them. So I was purely just doing this from a speed point of view, really rough, using the knife tool, ending up with lots of triangles around the place. I find that's an okay way to model. I quite enjoy just freeforming it and then tidying things up later. I do have a low poly character course, which if you're interested in that, I go through a much more precise way of modeling these characters. Check the description for a discount link if you're interested in that. 
When it comes to the clothing, I do model that as part of the object. I don't model it on top of, if that makes sense. You'd only do that if you had a character where you wanted to change their clothing quite often. The hat, however, I do model as a separate object because I want that to be animated and lift off his head when the ship drops. And it was around this sort of point where I started to think maybe this would be fun if this was all animated. So at this point, I get the rigify rig and plonk it into position. I thought it might be nice to have him point, so I separated the handout so it had a extra finger. I do like to use the whole rigify rig, so you can kind of generate a rig with lots of controls on it, but it can be a bit awkward for beginners, so just stick to the normal rig if you want to animate a character and don't generate the special rigify rig, because like I say, that can be quite a pain for a beginner. And you can probably see I've got a few weight painting issues and I sort those out a little bit later. And that's part of the problem. As a beginner, you're trying to figure out all the weights and which layer even are the bones on that you have to weight to. It's all a real pain. So I've got the position roughly where I want it. Now I start splitting things up and marking out some UVs. For the crew member, I just cut in a few extra areas so that I can separate out the clothing from the skin. Initially, when I was texturing it, I thought about unwrapping and adding a gradient texture to my objects, but it didn't seem to work with this scene, so I just kept it really simple and just used basic colors. It was still helpful to have it unwrapped because I could easily select sections and add texture slots, but it's something that's not absolutely necessary. I do generally find it easier just simple texture slots rather than a texture grid or gradient grid that I'm using here. And it does still export okay, it means a little bit more work the other end in something like Unity, but it's not a big deal really. Okay, so let's quickly talk lighting. You can see from the top view here how many different lights I have in my scene. And if I zoom in a bit and go to render view, I'm trying to get, in some instances, a rim light, so this sort of shine on the edge there. I want it to be fairly light, but still look a little bit like nighttime. And you'll notice if I look at the lights, they're different colors as well, mainly blues and a little bit of yellows in there. That gives the scene a bit more saturation in the colors and a bit more vibrancy with that sort of low poly feel. If I go to the shading workspace and take you to the world, you can see that I've got an HDRI hooked up as well. I'll turn on the render and you can see the effect of that. If I bring this down to zero, you can see just the lights and then changing it to one. The HDRI not only lights the scene, but it adds the reflections of my objects as well, especially for the water, that's really important. So for the animation, all the boat objects, so all these different objects, including the person, is attached to an empty called the boat controller. And you can see in my timeline down here, the different keyframes for this controller. So it falls down with the wave, a little bit behind the wave, falls down, sploshes in so it goes a bit deeper than the wave and then bobs up and down until it lifts up slowly again, and then the process repeats. Then something like the person here, I'll go into pose mode and select all so you can see the bones. They've got the initial falling down with the boat controller because it's connected to that, but then I animate it separately. So there's a keyframe there where it's above the boat and his arms are out wide, falls down and meets the boat, then crouches down really slightly in this sort of area and then bobs back up again. And as you can see, there's no keyframes here because he's just following the boat. And then at this point, he's pointing into the distance saying we need to go there and the whole animation starts again. So most of my animation is controlled by the boat control here. And then it's just got this sort of secondary animation on it for the detailed parts of his movement. And that's all the aspects of the boat. So for the wave animation, you can see that I've used shape keys. With shape keys, you can move your individual vertices around in something like sculpt mode and then set that position as a shape key. So if I take us to frame 95, you can see that they're all set to zero and full wave is the original position of my wave. I'll just turn the modifiers off so you can see what that looks like. It looks rather strange, but I'll explain more about that later on. But for now, if we go across to the shape keys, which is under the object data properties, that's the original shape. Then there's different stages, as you can see with the keyframes here, that are controlled by the shape keys. So no wave here is like that. The crashing part is like this. Crashing two, crashing three, and crashing four. And you can see there's a bit of stretching, but I sort that out with the modifiers. So it slowly animates the shape of the wave, as you can see going here, slowly crashes down and collapses like this and then bobs around a bit as I kind of change the animation. As you can see, the influence of the shape keys change here and then builds up again and repeats. 
and you can see there's no sort of micro animation here. That's controlled by the modifiers. So let's go across to the modifiers. I'll take them one by one. First of all, there's a remesh. So it remeshes the shape from the shape keys. So the distortion and stretching is taken out by a remesh. And that's like the remesh you get in sculpt mode. Really basic, just turns it into quads and makes it this simple shape. But that means that I don't get that stretching of the wave that we got. Let's turn that off. And you can see there's a bit of stretching, especially on that bit, the mesh stretches. So that's what the remesh does. Then to add that triangulation, I use a decimate modifier. And you can see what the decimate does. It reduces the poly count and I put it on 0.2 and it triangulates the mesh. But because I've used that remesh with it, there's no stretching, it triangulates it, and I think it works really nicely and fits the style. Although it has some sort of flicker to it as it remeshes and decimates, it doesn't have a lot of movement, especially when we get to the top here as there's a pause. So the next modifier is a displacement modifier. The displacement is just a Voronoi texture. So texture 001, I'll show you what that looks like. So a Voronoi texture like this. I don't think I changed any of the attributes much because it's not necessary. If I go back to the modifier, you can see what that displacement does. It just pushes the mesh out slightly, but it's controlled by an empty. If you look at the empty, it's got two keyframes and that's purely just rotating round. And it rotates around quite slowly. I'll go into wireframe mode so you can see that and it just rotates around like that and that just makes the waves flicker. And in fact, I didn't even take off the ease in and ease out. Can you see how it slows down and speeds up as it gets to the middle? Because all I needed was a little bit of animation on the waves to make them move slightly. So back to the wave, back to Eevee and onto the last one, which was a Boolean. So that cuts off the shape in this circle like this. I'll show you the Boolean sphere that I made and I think you can see its whole shape in rendered mode. So it looks like this and that just cuts out that circular section. So all of them together look like this. And it did take a fair bit of experimentation to get to this point, but I'm pleased with the final result. And the last thing to talk about is the particle system. So I've got two, one with the waves and one with the smoke. They're set up very similar. I've got the objects down here. There's my smoke and there's my wave particles. So I use a collection for the particle system. Let's click on the particle system and go to the particle properties. Again, this took a fair bit of experimentation. If I move it on slightly, you can see the emitter there, which is this sort of shape. And I've animated the lifetime and you can see that goes up slightly here and then splashes out. And the splash is created by this wind force field here. So I'll go to the force field settings and the strength you can see that's animated and you can see these lines are a visual representation of the strength. So that pushes the particles away and there's a turbulence. If I go to wireframe, zoom in a bit, somewhere around here anyway, there is a turbulence. Yes, there it is. And again, that's animated as well to throw the particles out like they're a wave. And you can see them sort of being pushed around the place when the boat hits the water. So that's the two force fields and the particle system, which obviously is animated to follow the wave, as you can see it following the wave around here. And let's go to the particles again. The lifetime is the important bit that's animated. So it varies. So it has less lifetime here, so you can hardly see them and then it builds up as the wave rises and then splashes down as it repeats, like so. The clouds, much simpler, so no animation on those. The only thing that is important to change with these is the field weights. I turned down the gravity so that they would sort of float upwards and turned off the wind and turbulence so they wouldn't be affected by this wind and turbulence that the waves are. So there we have it, my low poly animated boat project. Let me know what you think in the comments. And let me know if you like this sort of breakdown tutorial or you want more in-depth tutorials about certain aspects. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.